what is your earliest memories of the sport and what inspired you like, in terms of um, your need and want to get into cricket media? 1992, when I was walking past um, the TV at home and I heard a woman's voice on the commentary box and it was like the way you would stop when something really grabs you and it was the voice of Donna Simmons. I ran into the kitchen and I said to my mom, that's it. I think I'm going to be South Africa's first female cricket commentator. Life. And I said, I'm going to commentate because I have that feeling that I have a role to play to unite this country, to bring a diverse voice into cricket. I was told that I would be eaten up by um, all commentators, Tony, Greg and the like, and I should really just be a continuity presenter. But I just pushed ahead like a, a steely Capricorn. And one day is one day, right? Um, the cricket anchor for SABC resigned and there was an opportunity for someone to debut at the Cricket World Cup in 2003 and that was me. Appreciate that everyone sees the game differently. Everyone has a different opinion. Criticism, uh, if handled properly, uh, can be a great tool for change and for learning. So the way I handled it was firstly, I had to go Google myself and read the bad comments. And I ICC awards with Harsha Bogle. Oh, Harsha is just an incredible broadcaster. So working with him so early on in my career was uh, a huge feather in my cap. He is someone I deeply admire and respect. And then the 100 coming up in the UK. You're going to be coming over. I think the 100 is going to have a very captive market. I'm glad to be part of it because I think that old school ability of doing the basics right is never going to go away. It's just about how flexible are we to see the game differently from a new set of eyes? So Cricket Life Stories with me, Neil Kagra. Today we're joined by Kaz Naidu. Kaz, how's things going down in South Africa? South Africa is always beautiful, sunny, even though we're moving into a change of season and it's been a wonderful day in Johannesburg. And I'm looking forward to joining you for your summer. It's going to be my first uh, sporting summer in the UK. So I'm really looking forward to it. Yes, we'll, we'll get on to the 100 shortly. But let's, before we do, let's take it all the way back with yourself. What is your earliest memories of the sport and what inspired you? Like, in terms of um, your need and want to get into cricket media? I love early memories because it really, it gives you goosebumps and reminds you why you started and, and where it all started. I remember Clive Rice leading um, a South African team in India. And I remember the wild and ecstatic crowds in India and those scenes being beamed back to South Africa. It was 1991, I was 13 years old. And I had these little butterflies in my heart and I could feel them and I felt like first love and it was my first love for cricket. I didn't realize how deep it was until 1992 when I was walking past um, the TV at home and I heard a woman's voice on the commentary box and it was like the way you would stop when something really grabs you and it was the voice of Donna Simmons. This velvety Barbadian accent, the most powerful golden voice and she was calling the game and I was still standing there 20 minutes later and when her stint finished I waited hours for the next time I could hear her voice. I ran into the kitchen and I said to my mom that's it I think I'm going to be South Africa's first female cricket commentator and of course everybody laughed because I had no history of, of being involved in the game or playing in the game but coming out of um, apartheid and struggle and being readmitted to sport those early memories uh, were the foundation for this amazing career of mine. Did you study journalism in school, university? And is that something that you would encourage youngsters or do you feel as if it's more a work experience thing or a combination of everything? I, I'm sure you've interviewed a number of uh, broadcasters and people in media and everybody has a different journey. I think my advice is you've got to start somewhere. And uh, my somewhere was, I wasn't sure. There wasn't a woman who had done it before in South Africa, so I didn't have that. But I watched TV and I could see they were interviewing people and, and they needed to know uh, certain things. And I thought, well, 
maybe I need to be a good interviewer. And I found a journalism course and I did it. And all through um, every course, every class, I told the lecturer, I really don't want to be a journalist. I want to be a commentator. And of course, I told everybody that until they were sick of me. But let me tell you what being a journalist taught me. Um, accuracy, how to tell good stories, how to work towards deadlines, how to arrive on time for assignments. And all that plays into uh, your commentating career because all that fits in, punctuality, accuracy, and the ability to turn a story around. Um, so I studied journalism and I got into the newspapers and I became a court and crime reporter. And I became very good at sniffing out crime stories. <laughs> But I really didn't like it at all. And I, and I hated being good at it. I just wanted to be a commentator. So I quit my job and um, I, I drove up to Johannesburg uh, with my boyfriend and we started a life here. And I said, I'm going to commentate because I have that feeling that I have a role to play to unite this country, to bring a diverse voice into cricket. Um, Middle-aged white men, really good at what they do, really satisfying a part of society but the large majority really needed a voice and I wanted so desperately to be that voice. So journalism gave me a foundation um, to become uh, someone credible quite early in my career. And how did the opportunity to move actually into sport, into cricket come about? How did the path align? I've always said you've got to be at the right place at the right time. And I was, I was doing a job I didn't really want to be doing, but I bumped into someone really influential while I was doing it. And um, he was, uh, he's a premier sports anchor in South Africa, Robert Marawa. And I saw him and I just had this fangirl moment. I ran up and I told him what a fan I was. And he asked me what my dream was. And I said, well, I want to be South Africa's first female cricket commentator. And he said, well, you're in the wrong job. Let me introduce you to the person you need to speak to. Long story short, I got introduced to uh, the head of sport at SABC Sport. And they said, well, we'll train you and we'll see how you go and um, maybe something will come up. So I said, OK. And I was trained for a few months. I was told that I would be eaten up by um, all commentators, Tony Gregg and the like, and I should really just be a continuity presenter. But I just pushed ahead like a, a steely Capricorn. And one day is one day, right? Um, the cricket anchor for SABC resigned. And there was an opportunity for someone to debut at the Cricket World Cup in 2003. And that was me. That was my story to getting in. Did you ever worry that you had never actually played the sport? It seems cricket, you know, as a sport, if you compare it against others, it's one where it's dominant in terms of when you look at the commentary box, players, both men and women have played X amount of test matches. I think it's a theme that plays through my career in different ways. And uh, it, as the seasons go and the experience improves, I'm able to land in a place of comfort. And I say that with the greatest amount of respect of people who've maybe pivoted and become experts. But right from the word go, I was quite clear that my job, whether in the commentary box or as an anchor, was to get the story out of the experts. My job was to make you as the fan get closer to the game. So it was very clear at the beginning that I was not an expert. But throughout my career, um, that imposter syndrome, of course, creeps up in, in weird and mysterious ways at times you least expect it. And the way I address that is always remember that the heart of it all is credibility. And if you know what your role is in the game, and if you understand why you do what you do, then you'll never try to be something that you're not. So I, I'm never the expert. If there's an LBW decision to be called, be sure that my mic is down and the expert is going to be talking more than I am. And I was given some great advice in 2006 by Richie Benno. And he said, when you have nothing to say, say nothing. And um, especially with test match commentary, I find that it's such a story that unfolds over a few days that there's time to put your mic down. I'm not sure how it's going to be with 100. I think it's going to be a bit more helter skelter, but um, a deep respect for the game. I have a deep respect for the game. I, I don't take it lightly. I have a respect for the experts. I think there's a big role for broadcasters like me because we're able to bring the best out of the former players, especially. And then you mentioned 2003, you became the first female cricket commentator in South Africa, a home World Cup as well. How did that make you feel? Do you recall the moment? 
or given the um, and emotions that you're feeling? I, I think it, it, I still can't put it into words because I think the entire experience, I, I, I allowed myself to just go through the journey with no expectation. I was told that I would host a few World Cup games for SABC and they would see how it would go. And I ended up hosting the final, which I, I was really excited about. And then in 2005, when New Zealand came out, I was given the opportunity um, to have the mic for the first time. And what was great about that is I was eased into cricket broadcasting. I was brought up by Robin Jackman. I sat on the step as he commentated at Wanderers Stadium um, in the 2005, six season. And he gave me great advice throughout that by the time I, I really got into cricket commentary, um, the gentlemen of the game, were the ones who were able to share the secrets of the game with me. And what I appreciated about that is some of those secrets didn't work for me as a woman in the game. Um, the double-breasted blue blazer, the pinstripe tie, um, I tossed that. I wore bright colored t-shirts and I had a laugh and I just wanted to be fun. But it's so important to be able to have these, these mentors. So from 2003 onwards, uh, I just had this excitement. I always bubble when I talk about cricket because that moment in 2003 was game changing for me. Yeah. A teenage dream coming alive in such a big way. It was pre-social media, so I was lucky that I wasn't trolled. If there was any trolling that was gonna happen, it didn't happen, but I did receive handwritten letters from, from viewers who were really happy to see a woman on TV. And then I received letters from people who would rather hear a man talk about cricket because it's more credible. So there was just such a mixed bag of commentary coming through about my presence there. Um, I took it as a, as a plus that I got in. And then you mentioned the, the slight negatives that you received. How, would you, how did you respond to them? Did you use the, that as motivation? No, I think it's important that we appreciate that everyone sees the game differently. Everyone has a different opinion. Criticism, uh, if handled properly, uh, can be a great tool for change and for learning. So the way I handled it was firstly, I had to go Google myself and read the bad comments. And at that stage, the chat groups were quite right. And people would just say nasty things. And I would go read them and I would take good parts of it. Like maybe she speaks too quickly. And then I learned that maybe I should slow down because I'm a little bit too excited and nervous. So instead of thinking badly about the people who gave the feedback, I started learning how to become better. And I think it's a great um, bit of advice that I would give young journalists coming into sport, in particular women, is take everything with a pinch of salt and just get better. It really is about just getting better. And you, do, So even now to this day, do you also look back at the commentary stints that you've done, performances that you've done, and look back and just see how you can improve. Is that, again, another tip that you would give for aspiring journalists, commentators, those wanting to get into the media, always looking to refine your skills, looking back at past performances? I don't know about you, but I, in the early days, I found it really difficult to watch myself or listen to myself on radio. My husband insists on me listening and watching to my, myself on broadcasts now because it's the best way to learn. It's just a little uncomfortable to be your own critic sometimes, but a strong coffee and an open heart and you can get anything done really. Um, I love learning. I have a tendency to tap my pen um, in the last couple of overs. When So it's these little things that you start ironing out, but it is my 18th year in commentary and I believe I have a long way to go. I was speaking to John Helm, the football commentator, the other day, and he's been in the game for like 50 years, right? <laughs> so I just said, I'm a kid. I'm still a kid, yet I've done 18 years, and, and that's cricket's a funny game, right? You've been in the game 18 years, but the longer you're in the game, the longer you need to be in the game to be credible. How do you cope with nerves? You smile, because have you ever tried to smile and be nervous at the same time? <laughs> you can't be. Um, you smile and you learn to breathe. Because a lot of the nervousness I find comes from not breathing. from um, And the panic sets in because you're not breathing and there's no oxygen going to your brain. And I think the other thing is turn the attention on to the viewer. Because the less you think about yourself, the, the less nervous you will be. And the more you think about the role you're playing in their excitement, the less nervous you will be. 
Um, so I started doing post-match presentations in international cricket in 2004. And I was really young and really green. Um, and I was getting ready to do my first post-match presentation. Robin Jackman came up to me and he said, you don't look like you know what you're about to do, do you? And I said, <laughs> I don't know what I'm about to do. And he said, well, you're about to go out in front of thousands of people to interview Andrew Straub and Kevin Peterson and the South African players. And it's a big moment. So come introduce yourself to Clive Lloyd. He's the match referee. So I introduced myself to the great Clive Lloyd that he will be choosing the player of the match. These are the questions you should be asking. Don't be nervous, smile, breathe and come up and uh, have a chat when you do a good job and don't ask dumb questions. I think I asked one dumb question and he did say, well, that, that was a, a dumb question to Andrew Strauss, but well done. And that was the day I learned how to harness my nerves quite early on. But they creep up every now and again because new experiences are meant to test you. Uh, nerves never go away. And if they were meant to go away, well, why try anything new, right? And then in 2007, you also hosted the ICC Awards with Harsha Bogle. Again, how was that as a moment in your career? Oh, Harsha is just an incredible broadcaster. So working with him so early on in my career was uh, a huge feather in my cap. He is someone I deeply admire and respect. Um, I bumped into him in Mumbai, or he came through to see me last year when I was there. And he's always got great advice, great nuggets of wisdom. And I look up to him. And then you moved into more of a corporal afterwards, didn't you, with Cricket South Africa. Can you talk through that moment in your, in your career as well? So in 2007, I'd really hit a glass ceiling. Um, I felt as though I was growing too quickly in cricket broadcasting. Everything was going quickly and I was 29 years old and suddenly people were calling me seasoned. And I thought, well, yeah, I'm not seasoned. I feel like I have so much to learn. And I decided to take a break from cricket broadcasting, but I really wanted to stay involved. So I applied for a job at Cricket South Africa and I got a job to be their commercial manager in charge of shaping the brands of Cricket South Africa and the pro tiers. And we got to really transform the game from the ground up with an all women communications team in 2009. Uh, at a time when it wasn't actually popular for there to be women leaders in the game at that level. It was four years that I understood for the first time the challenges that Black people have gone through in cricket in South Africa and the role that I was able to play to change the narrative. And I will never forget it. And then the move back into media. I know you hosted the, the 2015 World Cup. Talk us through the transition back in. Well, I think the big learning from that was coming back after having three children. Um, so coming back as a mom into Coventry had its own challenges. Missing my children, I have, my third born is born on the third day of the Boxing Day Test Match. So I'm always a wreck on day three. Um, so those were the challenges coming back is leaving my children going on tour and finding a new voice and a new understanding of who I was as a mother. Uh, a lot of people say, you've got to choose, you either be in corporate or you choose to be a mom and I got to live the best of both worlds, but my heart was always at home. And that was the big challenge for me is um, putting on a smile and being happy for the viewers, but really in my heart wanting to be home. I'm over that hurdle. My kids are a lot bigger now and all three are aspiring cricketers. So we all talk cricket and we're all talking about the hundred, what's going to happen. Do I know what's going to happen? So I've got my, uh, my uh, three very inquisitive minds here at home and cricket has changed for me from where it was 10 years ago. Then when you reflect back on the surface, the job looks amazing, interacting with global superstars in the game, traveling the world, but there undoubtedly must be some difficult moments as well. Has there been one or two that perhaps stand out that you don't mind sharing? I'm quite a boring person on tour. <laughs> so I have set routines. I get up at 4.30 in the morning. I do yoga. I read. I get ready. I go to a test match. I come back and I get ready and I do the same thing every day. Um, and I'm the first one on a plane back home. Um, as soon as that match is done, I'm on the phone saying, first ticket out, that's me, I'm out of here. 
But what I enjoy about being on tour are the friends that we make and um, the challenges that we go through together as a team. Being away from home is, is challenging, not just for women and not just for moms. Uh, there are dads on tour. There are families that don't see each other for a few months. Those are the things that make it difficult being away. And um, I have a rule of just keeping a, a very good friendly distance because it's just safer and, and, it's, and it's more pro professional really for me to, to live that. So yeah, um, no, I don't have any real stories from that. I think mostly uh, the stories are the funny stuff that happens on air really. I mean, you know, anything that is live is funny. If you get it wrong or, or someone's hiding your shoe before you've got to go live, yeah, those fun things happen, but it keeps you, it keeps you honest in a broadcasting environment. Yeah, what has been the standout moment in your career so far? Wow, I used to know before. I, there used to be like that was the moment making my debut in 2003. And then there was the 438 game in 2006, 32,000 people at one was amazing. Just recently, I got to commentate on the Pakistan Super League when uh, cricket returned to Pakistan. And right now, that is the most relevant moment for me. Um, being part of a, a uniting process in South Africa through cricket and being able to go to Pakistan and play the same role and see the same results was just mind-blowing for me. Cricket is such a unifier and I think whatever format it is and um, whether it's new or whether it's test match cricket, um, as soon as we talk cricket we have a smile on our face. So Pakistan really just stands head, head and shoulders above quite a few experiences that I've had and there have been some really good ones. And then the 100 coming up in the UK. You're going to be coming over. How excited are you? To be oh man, I am so excited. I, I don't know what to expect, which is why I'm excited. I love being tested and, I, and I've done a fair amount of test match commentary and I've been involved in, in so many great international moments. I feel like the 100 is going to test me. I think it's going to test us all. Um, those of us who think we are purists and we want to focus on certain formats and we're not ready for this kind of disruption. Being a mom of three um, aspiring cricketers and gamers, I watch them. They, they have different ways, different um, ability to deal with three or four devices at the same time. They consume content and entertainment so differently. I think the hundred's gonna have a very captive market. I'm glad to be part of it because I think that old school ability of doing the basics right is never going to go away. It's just about how flexible are we to see the game differently from a new set of eyes. So there was a new promo that came out and there was this very cool track and all three kids ran in and it was the 100 promo. I was like, I get it. I see. It's, it's not really meant for the generation who say, well, you know, we don't need change. It really is for a new generation. And, and I think that a lot is being put into it. I'm delighted. I, I can't wait. I'm nervous and I'm excited too. And then just a general question. Do you believe there are opportunities in cricket for those wanting to get in at different levels, whether it be on, a, on the more the written side or presenting, commentating? How do you see the game overall globally for those wanting to get into the media? I think COVID has changed a lot and everybody now is a broadcaster. So that is the first thing I want to say to everybody who's watching, who probably hasn't got the gig they've been waiting for. And the more content you're putting out at the moment, the more content we're seeing of you. Um, so when you asked me for an interview request, the first thing I did was pop onto your channel and I found myself watching a few interviews and learning a few new things about the game. Everybody out there, has an opportunity to create their own content. Um, there are platforms out there to so keep going at it because at some stage, someone's going to spot you or you will find yourself in a room you didn't even think you were aspiring to be in. My biggest advice is to read what you want to be brilliant at, at least 45 minutes a day. Because if you do that, it's, it's like practicing outside off what to play and what to leave. It's almost the same thing. Learning will never stop. And the more you learn, the more confident you are. And when you land that gig that you've been waiting for, you get this warm feeling in your tummy and these butterflies start flying in formation and you can't believe it. So think about that feeling and work backwards 
to the work that needs to be put in because consistency wins all the time. And then just to end on perhaps a mentor of yours that you've spoken to in the past, is there one nugget, nugget of advice that they gave you that you, you wouldn't mind sharing as well, just for the benefit of those wanting to, again, get into the cricket media game? So many things to tell you, but I want to leave you with something that helps you in the tough times. Because when things are going well, you don't need advice because you're celebrating. But when things are tough, you need a good bit of advice. Harsha Bogley gave me the best bit of advice in that regard. And he said, develop a backbone and use it. So be strong about it. In good times and in bad, trust yourself and back yourself. And once I learned that quite early in my career, I'm, I'm able to take on the challenges. So I really wish that you were able to back yourself and trust yourself and, and realize that whatever the age is, when the opportunity comes, it's yours to take. Perfect. Kaz, thank you very much for your time today. Really thank appreciate you, yeah. it. I can't wait to see you on our screens in the UK for the 100th this summer. It's going to be amazing. Looking forward to it. So Neil Kagram, Cricket Last Stories, Kaz Naidu, thank you.